Hello everyone, my little angels. How are you all? Oh my God, it's been a while since I have come here to talk to you about chemistry. Well, well, well. If you can recapitulate, in our previous video, we had understood about atoms and molecules, where we tried to learn about their existence, how they exist. All right, how atoms combine to give rise to molecules, and in what particular ratio they combine of their mass to form the compounds that they do. At the same time, we learned how to write the chemical formula. So, when we have discussed about atoms, we have already discussed about matter followed by atoms. Now, we are going to try to understand the very structure of the atom. And how is that? Well, let's look at the table of contents to understand. So, first we will talk about the charged particles in the matter. We will then talk about the various models, which includes Thomson's model, Rutherford's model, followed by Bohr's model. Then we will talk about the neutrons. And finally, finally, we will learn about how these electrons are distributed in different shells. What exactly is the term valency? What do we understand by it? Then we will learn about the atomic number, the mass number, how they are different, how they are related. And we will learn about isotopes and their applications followed by isobars. So there is a lot to cover but let me tell you all of that that we are planning to cover today in this particular video is quite interesting and I want you all to bear with me to understand everything in detail so that this world of science this world of chemistry becomes easy for you to decode so let's begin with the session why the weight so, the charged particles in matter. Now, this particular tube is known as discharge tube. Don't worry, we'll learn about it in the other 5-10 minutes. But before that, Let's try to understand what exactly is an atom. See, we know today that atom is made up of certain subatomic particles which are nothing but the protons, the neutrons, the electrons. But was it something that was easy to discover? Did that happen just overnight? Well, not. A lot of research has gone into it, a lot of studying has gone into it and a lot of elaboration has gone into it for us to understand this very clear point that atom in turn is made up of subatomic particles which are the protons, the electrons and the neutrons. So what is our you know understanding of this before we get there? It is important how we understand the discovery. How was it discovered? Who discovered it? What went into it? That is what is going to make this interesting for you. But before we get there, I want you to look at this discharge tube. This particular tube is known as discharge tube. And this discharge tube experiment, also known as cathode ray experiment, played a huge role to understand, to arrive at the fact that atom has a certain subatomic particle called electron. What all do we have to notice over here? The fact that there is a cathode Cathode is a positive, sorry, cathode is a negatively charged electrode. Then we have an anode, which is a positively charged electrode. Then we have a glass tube, we have a vacuum pump, and we make sure that the pressure that is there under this particular tube is very, very low. All right. Now, why are we understanding this ma'am? Why are we looking at this ma'am? For this particular experiment, that is the cathode ray experiment for the discovery of the very important, the electron. The electron. Alright. So, 
electrons were discovered by J. J. Thomson. So, who was the one who discovered electrons? It was J. J. Thomson who discovered electrons in 1897. That is 100 years before I was born. And on the basis of a detailed study of cathode rays. Cathode rays. Now, what are these cathode rays? Rays, beam of light. Cathode rays, beam of light emerging from the cathode. What was the cathode? Cathode was the negatively charged terminal or the negative electrode that we saw in the discharge team. Let's elaborate. Let's learn more about it. So, the cathode rays were discovered during the studies of passage of electricity through gases at extremely low pressure. Now, why are, why are we mentioning low pressure? Well, first things first, I want you to understand that gases are not good conductors of electricity. Alright, so how do we make them good conductors of electricity? By lowering the pressure. Alright, and these studies were known as discharge tube experiments. Alright, so gases as I have already said are bad conductors of electricity and under ordinary pressures, okay. Under ordinary pressures, they are bad conductors. But at a high voltage, okay, at a high voltage, under low pressure, they conduct electricity. They conduct electricity. They are good conductors. And because of the flow of electricity, because of the flow of electricity, a certain rays are formed. A certain beam of light is what you see. Alright, and these rays are known as our very own cathode rays. Why are they known as cathode rays? Because they emerge from the cathode. Alright, alright then. The studies of the cathode rays show that these rays consist of negatively charged particles known as electrons. Not only did these studies confirm that there is an electron that is present inside an atom along with it it also confirmed about the charge that this particular particle carries which is a negative charge okay then let's move on from here so with this we have understood okay what the cathode ray experiment is all about that is there is this cathode the cathode is you know able to emerge emerge you know you see rays emerging from the cathode which are known as cathode rays why is this happening because of the conduction of electricity by the gases that are present in the discharge tube all right and what is the condition of this gas that this gas is at a very low pressure and at a very high voltage that is why it is able to conduct electricity. I hope it is clear till here. Let's now try to understand about this particular discharge tube which I have been mentioning again and again. So this discharge tube is a long glass tube in which two circular metal plates are sealed at both the ends. So it is a long glass tube and there are two metal plates which are present at both the ends as I have drawn in this image over here. My drawing is not that great but I want you to understand what I am trying to say. So please bear with the drawing that I am making. Alright. Okay, so these metal plates are called electrodes. What are these metal, metal plates called better? They are called electrodes. So the plate which is connected to the positive terminal of the battery, okay, is known as the anode. Okay, so this is the anode. The one which is connected to the negative terminal of the battery is known as the cathode. Okay, so something like this. Okay, okay. So, for reducing the pressure inside the tube, how do we reduce the pressure? By removing the gas out of the tube, we can reduce the pressure. More the gas, more the pressure. That is, more is the bombardment of the particles of the gas on the tube, on the inner walls of the tube, thereby, you know, contributing to the pressure. If I reduce the number, Will the pressure not decrease? It will. And that is exactly what we are trying to do. We reduce the pressure inside the tube. And how was this done? By, by a vacuum pump which, which vacates or which sucks the gases that are there inside the tube to the point that the amount of pressure or the amount of gases that we require is there. Alright? Okay. So, this is about our discharge tube. All right. Now, let's try to understand how the entire functioning of this is happening. 
So when the air or gas inside the discharge tube is taken at normal atmospheric pressure and high electric voltage, no electricity is passed that we are aware of. When will the electricity be passed? When the pressure is reduced. When is the pressure reduced? When the pressure is reduced to about 10 to the power minus 2 atmospheres. Okay, then you see that electricity is flowing through the gas. Alright, electricity is flowing through the gas. And because of this electricity that is flowing through the gas, a light is emitted in the tube. A light is emitted in the tube. And does this light have a color? Yes, it does have a color. Depending upon the gas that we are using, this light has a color. So, if I am using neon, if I am using neon, the color of the gas is reddish orange. It is reddish orange. Just imagine how pretty a color it is. If I have to give you the name, you can say that it is crimson in color. Beautiful reddish orange in color. Okay, ma'am. We have understood that electricity is being passed. But what about the cathode rays? Well, 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 we will now see how the cathode rays comes into picture. So, when the pressure of this particular gas inside the discharge tube is reduced to 10 to the power minus 4 atmosphere, then the emission of the light, okay, by air or gas stops. So, the emission of the light has stopped. Then what do we see? We see... Okay, though inside, though inside of the discharge tube now appears to be dark. The walls of the discharge tube opposite to the cathode started to glow with a greenish light known as fluorescence. So, what we are seeing is we are not seeing any light. Instead, we are seeing that the wall opposite to the cathode Okay, the wall opposite to the cathode, there is this greenish light which is known as fluorescence is observed. And this observation clearly shows that some invisible rays, so what do you understand over here? Cathode rays are invisible. So, some invisible rays are coming from the cathode which travels in the straight line and strikes at the glass wall opposite to the cathode. It travels in straight line and it strikes opposite to the wall of the cathode and because of its striking, okay, and they are invisible, we cannot see them, but because it is striking, a gas is seen, a light, a different kind of green colored light is seen on the wall which is known as fluorescence. And since these rays are coming from the cathode, they are known as cathode rays. I hope this is clear. I hope the fact about cathode rays, discharge tube and how this cathode rays emitted is clear to you. Now, 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 what are the characteristics of the cathode rays? It is because of these characteristics of the cathode rays, we were, we were able to arrive at the fact that these cathode rays are nothing but electrons, the entities of electrons, they carry electric, uh, they, sorry, they carry entities of electrons in them. What are it? They always travel in a straight line. Okay, this we are aware. They can produce mechanical effects because cathode rays consist of material particles and possess energy, the light that you are able to see. Right? They carry a negative charge. Tada! Now we know the charge of that entity. It is negative. They have heating effect. They produce heating effect. And they can penetrate through thin foil. And they ionize the gas through which they travel. Okay. These are the characteristics. Characteristics. Because of these characteristics, we were able to arrive at the fact. Okay. Other facts. There are other characteristics. Because of which we were able to arrive at the fact that it is an electron and it is negatively charged. Alright. They produce green fluorescence on the glass surface. The cathode rays, the charge of mass ratio, that is charge by mass ratio, okay, for the particles does not depend. This is important. It does not depend on the nature of the gas taken in the discharge tube. Okay. It does not depend upon the nature of the gas taken in the discharge tube. Okay. Or the nature of the cathode which has been taken. At the same time, they produce x-rays when they strike against the surface of metals like tungsten, copper, etc. And it was concluded that cathode rays produced from different gases are same 
and our negatively charged particles. Now, this is of our importance. All of the other facts, they were facts. But this is important that they are all the same and they are negatively charged particles present in them are also the same. These particles were thereby named as electrons. These particles were thereby named as electrons. What else? What else? What else? Let's now understand about electrons. Okay. So, by 1900, 1897, they started the discharge tube experiment. 1900 was known that the atom was not a simple indivisible particle, but it contained at least one subatomic particle and that one subatomic particle we understood is the electron. Okay. And it was discovered by J.J. Thomson. We are aware of this. Okay. An electron may be defined as a subatomic particle containing mass equivalent to 1 by 80, 1 1840th of that of hydrogen atom carrying one unit negative charge. What is important for us over here is the fact that they carry one unit negative charge. That means one electron carries one unit electron. Sorry. That means one electron carries one unit negative charge. Two electrons will carry two unit negative charge. So, what they are trying to say is if there is one electron, it will carry one unit negative charge. An electron contains negative charge and it is, it is denoted by the symbol E minus, minus as superscript. Okay, beta? Okay then. So, this is about electrons. So, what are the properties of electrons? The fact that its mass is 9.11 into 10 to the power minus 31 kgs or 9.11 into 10 to the power minus 28 grams. Then the fact that the charge is minus 1. Okay. The absolute charge is minus 1.602 in 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb. Okay. Absolute charge. That is the amount of charge it is carrying. Okay. And the mass, okay, mass ratio, mass ratio, charges to mass ratio is 1.76 coulomb per kg. What is important for us over here is this fact, this fact and this fact followed by this particular fact which is location of the electrons. They are located outside the nucleus of an atom. So, if there is an atom, they are located outside the nucleus of an atom. Alright, they are located outside the nucleus of an atom. So, this is how electron came into picture by the discharge tube experiment or the cathode ray experiment which was performed by J. J. Thomson. Now, what we are left with, now what we are left with is another subatomic particle. You must all be wondering what I am talking about. That is the proton. Okay, so the proton discovery was done by anode rays or canal rays, anode rays or canal rays. They were known as anode rays or canal ray experiment. Okay. So, what is an anode ray or canal ray? See, since an atom as a whole is electrically neutral. See, we are aware of the fact that an atom as a whole is electrically neutral and then we even came across the fact that it has an electron in it and this electron is negatively charged. So, for this particular atom to be electrically neutral, it needs to have a positive charge to cancel the negative charge of the electron and that raised the antennas or I would rather say raised the curious thought of the fact how is it neutral, what is contributing to its neutrality and that is when protons came into picture, the discovery came into picture. Let's read about it. So, since an atom as a whole is electrically neutral, Hence, the presence of negatively charged electrons in an atom suggested that there must be a positively charged particle as well. So, it has actually been found by experiments that all the atoms contains positively charged particles known as protons. It was experimentally found that all the atoms have positively charged entities and which we name it, they named it, we still call it protons. All right, and the existence of protons in an atom was shown by Goldstein. Goldstein, okay. Now, by using special perforated, perforated cathode, perforated, perforations, that is the cathode had the electrode, the negatively charged electrode had perforations in it. It had holes in it. All right, 
and he repeated the discharge tube experiment the only difference was that there they, he took a that is thompson took a perfectly perfectly uh, you know a solid cathode okay metal sheet here he took that is goldstein took a per, uh, you know a perforated metal plate okay now when the pressure in the tube is reduced we know that the pressure needs to be reduced for the conduction of electricity it was found that besides cathode rays new kind of rays are also found which traveled in opposite direction to the cathode rays that means cathode rays are giving radiation they are giving the rays which we know belongs to the electrons but the anode also released rays and since the cathode rays was in this direction anode rays was in the opposite direction so that raised questions that raised questions and because of this since these rays are coming from the side of the anode hence they are known as anode rays because anode is releasing these rays just like how cathode released rays they were known as cathode rays and just like how anode was releasing rays it was known as anode rays and they are also known as canal rays because they pass through the canals or the perforations or the holes in the cathode also the deflection in electric field shows that they contain positive charge we need to understand it is the electrons that conduct electricity now these 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 particles they deflected the electric current and thereby they are known to be having a positive charge and these rays are thereby known to be known as positive rays and thereby this lightest positively charged entity was named proton what we still call it today so we have now understood how the electron was discovered followed by how the proton was discovered okay ma'am what next so here are certain characteristics of the cano uh, anode rays which is it travels in straight lines contains you know material particles carries positive charge okay so you know on applying magnetic field anode rays are deflected in electric field also they are deflected okay and their mass ratio charge to mass ratio depends now this is important unlike cathode rays their charge to mass ratio depends upon the particles on on the nature of the gas and they also depend upon the particles of the nature of the gas okay they depend upon the particles of the nature of the gas so this is about anode rays this is about anode rays talking about protons these protons were observed as h plus by eugen goldstein which rutherford so basically eugen goldstein observed it rutherford confirmed it confirmed it that okay that nuclei of all elements were made up of nuclei of all elements were made up of the particles which particles the protons the protons okay and a proton may be defined as a subatomic particle containing mass equivalent to that of hydrogen atom and carrying one unit positive charge it contains positive charge and it is shown by the symbol p it is shown by the symbol p all right it is shown by the symbol p and its mass is 1.6 and 10 to the power minus 21 kgs its absolute charge is 1.6 1.602 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb and its charge is plus 1 clear so this is about the proton now what is important for us to understand that okay fine the electron is there the proton is there but how are they arranged in an atom that was another question after the discovery of the proton the electron the scientists were now wondering how are they actually arranged you know in the atom what is the arrangement so now we will come across the multiple models the multiple atomic models suggested by various scientists the first model that we are going to come across is thomson's model thomson's model okay thomson was the first one to propose a model for the structure of the atom thomson was the first one to propose the structure of the atom and what did he do 
Thomson proposed the model of an atom to be similar to that of a watermelon. His model is also known as watermelon model or pudding model because he tried to he tried to explain the model of an atom in such a way which is clearer to the respect you know with respect to that of the watermelon where he said that the positive charge is basically the red kernel that you see which we all eat and the negative charge are the seeds of the seeds of the watermelon that is what he said that the the electrons are the are are studded in the positively charged sphere like the seeds like the seeds in the watermelon so he said that this red color kernel that we eat is positively charged and the the, the electrons are like the the seeds that are present in the watermelon so that is what he suggested so basically what he suggested was that the entire the entire the entire kernel was positive all right and the negative charge the negative charge was embedded in it in the positive kernel in such a way that the magnitude of the positive kernel okay and the magnitude that is the magnitude of the positive charge and the negative charge were same but his model had drawbacks his model had drawbacks see atom what he proposed that an atom comes of a positively charged sphere and the electrons are embedded in it he said that and he said that the negative and the positive charges are equal in magnitude thereby the atom is electrically neutral this is what he suggested but understand one thing when primitive things you know when primitive models come into picture they also come with their set of drawbacks not saying that all primitive models have a drawback but generally because the loopholes that are there the drawbacks that are there they need to be countered and his model also had a drawback his model also had the drawback that is all the thomson's model explained that atoms are electrically neutral because he is saying that the negative and the positive charges are equal in magnitude but what he could not explain was the results of the experiments carried out by other scientists you know other scientists came up with other sets of experiments the gold foil experiment which is also known as rutherford's experiment there were multiple experiments that came into picture and he was unable to explain that so now what happened is his model was discarded so whose model did we consider so another model came into picture which is rutherford's model and rutherford is a great scientist great scientist all right so much so that he has received the nobel prize in chemistry in 1908 he is known as the father of nuclear physics his entire life's work was based on radioactivity radioactivity and the discovery of the nucleus of the atom okay with the gold foil experiment the gold foil experiment okay but before that he also suggested a model what model did he suggest he suggested a model he he, he suggested rutherford's model of an atom okay now ernst rutherford was interested in knowing how the electrons are arranged within an within an atom he wanted to know he was curious so what did he do he said let's do an experiment in this experiment he is using fast moving fast moving alpha particles okay and he is allowing them to fall upon thin gold foil now you must be having two questions now what is alpha particles and why gold foil only so let me start with gold foil you know gold is malleable right highly malleable why because it is a metal metals are malleable well gold foil is highly highly malleable okay and the reason he chose that was because it was malleable but it also consisted 1000 atoms 1000 atoms in its width so it was 1000 atoms thick enough atoms for him to make an observation right along with it being thin great right then what are alpha particles doubly charged helium ions that is this is helium doubly charged he plus 2 okay and they have a mass of 4 units they are known as alpha particles and they have considerable amount of energy thereby they are able to strike the gold foil clear okay so let's try to see what exactly did he try to do see it was expected that the alpha particles would be deflected by the subatomic particles in the gold atoms since the alpha particles are heavier 
okay much heavier than the protons he did not expect to see large deflections so the thing was he, we were already aware of the fact that all right there was an electron there was a proton and they were aware of the fact that there are two entities two subatomic particles which are the protons and the electrons and he expected that when i pass this ray of you know alpha particles what will happen is it will deflect but not so much but not so much because these protons are much tinier and they don't carry that amount of mass and helium is much more you know in mass in comparison to protons but but contrary to his prediction contrary to his expectation is what he observed he saw he saw that most of the fast moving particles were passed straight through the gold foil how were they able to pass straight through the gold foil electrons are there protons are there they should have been deflected how is it able to pass through the foil and not just one or two most of them so that left him puzzled another thing that came into uh, that came into his observation is that some of the alpha particles were deflected by the foil by small angles okay they were deflected by small angles okay then surprisingly one out of every 12000 particles appeared to rebound this he had just not predicted he knew that there'd be deflection but rebound this was a surprise to him and this made him think why is it that there is a rebound why is it that most of the rays are passing through the thin foil so in the words of rutherford he said this result was almost as incredible as if you fire a 15 inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it come back and hits you because it's very thin and this alpha particle is heavier it is supposed to pass through instead it's rebounding great that left him boggled and that's when another thing came into his mind this is what it looks like you can see most of it are being able to pass through the foil some of them are being you know scattered deflected by small small angles as you can see over here over here but then a rebound rebound and see where is the rebound coming from something present at the center which today we call the nucleus something that he discovered right so what did he conclude now his conclusion is important he said that most of the space inside the atom is empty why because most of the rays are able to pass through simple because most of the alpha particles are able to pass through the gold foil without getting deflected makes sense second conclusion that he said was very few particles were deflected from their path very few since they were able to pass through indicating that the positive charge occupies very little space so this is one thing that he understood that very little particles are able to deflect that means a positive charge you know it, it occupies very little space then a very small fraction of alpha particles were deflected by 180 degrees indicating that all the positive charge and the mass of the gold atom were concentrated in a very small volume very small volume of the atom so a very small fraction rebound that is 180 degrees now going and then again going back so it is going like this and going back the angle is 180 degrees indicating that the entire mass is concentrated in a very small volume and that again raised his eyebrows he was like okay 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 and sorry and this is what he understood from the data he also calculated that the radius of the nucleus he said that there is something in the center 
and he understood that that is the nucleus. He said that this nucleus is about 1 naught 10 to the power 5 times less than that the radius of the atom, 10 to the power 5 times. Okay, there is a positively charged center in an atom called the nucleus. So, this is one thing he concluded that there is a positively charged center. So, so far we know that there is an atom, there is an electron, this is the electron beta, there is a nucleus, inside the nucleus is the proton. This is what has been concluded so far and nearly all the mass of the atom resides in this particular nucleus. Okay, great. What else? The electrons revolve around, the electrons this is important, the electrons revolve around the nucleus in circular paths. The electrons revolve in circular paths and the size of the nucleus is very small as compared to that of the atom. Obviously, it is residing inside the atom. It cannot outgrow the atom, right? So, the size of the nucleus is tiny and it is present inside the atom. This electron is revolving around the nucleus. This nucleus tends to have the proton and it is at this point, okay, where majority mass of the atom is concentrated. This is what he concluded. Yet, yet there were drawbacks for his model. Such a beautiful model but there were drawbacks to his model. And what were the drawbacks? The revolution of the electron in a circular orbit is not expected to be stable. Be according to classical mechanics, he was unable to explain how a positively charged, sorry, how a negatively charged entity is capable, to is capable of revolving around a positively charged entity without crashing into it, without collapsing into it. Of any particle in a circular orbit would undergo acceleration. During acceleration, charged particles would radiate energy. It is undergrowing, you know, so it is obviously going to increase its acceleration. There is going to be increase in the speed per unit time, increase in the velocity per unit time. So, it is going to accelerate, it is going to radiate energy. And once it is radiating energy, it is losing energy, alright. So, when an electron is radiating energy, it is losing energy. At one point, it will lose all its energy and fall into the nucleus. It will crash into the nucleus. Thereby, the atom will not exist only. That is what was the drawback. And if this were so, the atom should be highly unstable and hence the matter would not exist in the form that we know. Made sense. He was unable to explain this because with respect to classical mechanics, he would not be able to explain it. Then what happened? Then another scientist came into picture. Bohr. Bohr's model. Highly, highly uh, accepted model. Alright. And stands very true for hydrogen and hydrogen-like species. And stands very true for hydrogen and hydrogen-like species. What does Bohr say? But before I go there, let's see that Bohr is a Nobel Prize winner for his work that is the structure of the atom, alright. And you know he has written multiple books, multiple books which are like the, the Bible for chemistry, you know that important, alright. But having said that, let us now try to understand what did Bohr do different, what did he say different. So, in order to overcome the objections raised against Rutherford's model, so basically, he agreed with Rutherford's model, but, but the drawbacks, he tried, what he tried to do was, he was like, Rutherford has certain few drawbacks, no? His model is having certain few drawbacks. Let's overcome those drawbacks. And that's exactly what he did. He said, in order to overcome the objections raised by Rutherford's model of the atom, Niels Bohr put forward the following postulates. And these postulates are something that we follow even today. Only certain special orbits known as discrete orbits of electrons are allowed inside the atom. Okay. There are only certain orbits that are allowed inside the atom. And these orbits are discrete orbits. What else? While revolving in discrete orbits, the electrons do not radiate energy. Tada. Done. Finished. It was because the electrons are radiating energy that they lose all the energy and they will fall and collapse into the nucleus. Well, he said, 
that there are discrete orbits and when they are revolving in this particular discrete orbit, they don't radiate energy. Since they don't radiate energy, they don't lose out on all their energy. As a result of which, they don't collapse into the nucleus, thereby the atom sustains. So, this is what he put forth, a very brilliant idea and he explained it and justified it as well. Alright, and what else did he say? He called these orbits, these discrete orbits as shells. Shells. These orbits are shells, are known as energy, they are called energy. And their energy levels, energy levels, and their energy levels in an atom are shown like this. The innermost shell, <coughs> excuse me. The innermost shell closest to the nucleus is known as K shell. The second, okay, most closest shell is known as the L shell. Then the one after it is known as the M shell and the one after it is known as the N shell. So these orbits or shells are known as energy levels and he named them as K, L, M, N from inside to outside, okay, respectively. Also, you know, if not K, L, M, N, they can also be numbered as 1, 2, 3, 4 from inside to outside. So, he introduced the concept of energy levels. He introduced the concept of discrete orbits. And he said that in these particular discrete orbits, the electrons, <coughs> excuse me, which is, the electrons are not going to lose their energy. They are not going to radiate energy, thereby not losing energy. Okay, great. So, now comes the neutrons. Okay, we have seen about the electrons, the protons. We then saw Thomson's model. We saw Rutherford's model. And then we saw how the drawbacks of Rutherford's model was compensated, or I would rather say overcome, okay, by Bohr to give rise to the most accepted Bohr's atomic model. All right. Now we have come up or we have understood the two subatomic particles. This is the third subatomic particle which is known as neutron and this was discovered by Shadwick. It was discovered by Shadwick and it was eventually named as neutron. Why? Because they possess, neutrons are present in the nucleus of all atoms except hydrogen and they are known as, they are known as neutrons because they have no charge. They have no charge and their mass is nearly equal to that of the proton. So, they are called neutrons because they have no charge. Alright, and their mass is nearly equal to that of the proton. And all the elements have neutrons except hydrogen. Except hydrogen, all the elements have neutrons. And in general, a neutron is represented as n. And the mass of the atom is therefore given by the sum of the masses of the protons and the neutrons present in the nucleus. You must be asking why Rutherford's gold foil experiment. He observed and he thereby concluded that majority of the mass or I would rather say most of the mass of the atom was concentrated at a particular point which is the center of the atom. Alright. And he said, we, he knew that there are protons there after the discovery of neutrons. It was understood that the nucleus has protons and neutrons. Nucleus has the majority concentration of mass thereby. It is the protons and the neutrons which contribute to the mass of an atom. This is about neutrons. This is about neutrons. So now how are these electrons distributed in different orbits? Okay, there are electrons. Okay, there are orbits. How are they distributed though? That should be a question. That probably is a question arising in your head. That ma'am, how are they distributed? I have understood that there are electrons, protons, neutrons, protons and neutron are present in the nucleus. We follow Bohr's atomic model. There are various energy levels. How are they filled? Well, very simple. Electrons are present in the energy cell, energy levels, right? So, they will be filling them. How will they be filling them? Let's look at the rules. The maximum number of electrons present in the shell is given by the formula 2n square. The maximum number of electrons present in a shell is given by the formula 2n square where n is the orbit number or energy level index that is 1, 2, 3. 
हेंस द मैक्सिम नंबर ऑफ इलेक्ट्रॉन्स इन डिफरेंट शेल्स आर एज फॉलोज द फर्स्ट ऑर्बिट और के शेल विल हैव टू इन टू वन स्क्वेयर विच इज टू इलेक्ट्रॉन्स सेकेंड शेल दैट इज एल शेल विल हैव टू इन टू टू स्क्वेयर विच इज एट इलेक्ट्रॉन्स third orbit will have 2 into 3 square that is 18 electrons and the n shell will have 4 into 2 square which is 32 electrons this is what he suggested that the maximum number of electrons is equal to 2 into n square where n is equal to energy level okay okay so this is about it now what is the second rule that is the maximum the maximum number of electrons that can be accommodated in the outermost orbit is 8 outermost orbit that is excluding k outermost orbit 8 so if there is an electron and its electrons are present in k and l outermost orbit becomes l it it cannot have more than 8 clear what is the rule number 3 electrons are not accommodated in a given shell unless the inner shells are filled unless and until the inner shells are filled inner shells are filled that is if k has 2 l has 8 until and unless the inner shells are filled the electrons cannot be filled up in the higher energy level or higher shell all right that is the shells are filled in a step wise man one by one you cannot you know sit in first class and be like i will write 10th board exams no you have to sit in first you have to give clear its exam then second then third then fourth then fifth then sixth then seventh eighth ninth and finally 10th right you have to cross these energy levels you have to cross these stages in a step wise manner in a step wise manner similarly for the electrons as well all right so this is what it looks like the first 20 elements hydrogen helium lithium beryllium boron carbon nitrogen oxygen fluorine neon sodium magnesium aluminum silicon phosphorus sulfur chlorine and argon this is how the electrons are the electrons are distributed in their respective shells in their respective shells that is k l m and n or 1 2 3 and 4 clear so this is how the electrons are distributed now what exactly is valency this is another term which is quite new to you valency what is valency valency is nothing but the number of electrons that are present in the outermost shell okay of an atom is known as its valency that's exactly what is written the electrons present in the outermost shell of an atom are known as valence electrons they are known as valence electrons let me take a different color so that you will be able to see it better okay from the bohr bury scheme the bohr bury scheme where they are filling it in k l m n we also know that the outermost shell of an atom can accommodate a maximum of how many electrons beta 8 electrons so it was observed that the atoms of the elements completely filled with 8 electrons 8 electrons in the outermost shell show little chemical activity that is they are more stable that is they are more stable all right in other words their combining capacity or valency is zero if you have eight electrons in your valence shell if they have eight electrons in the valence shell zero their combining capacity is zero valency is the combining capacity it is their combining capacity all right how is it their combining capacity how is it their combining capacity see what happens is of the outermost shell okay it has let's say one Two, three. This becomes its. This becomes its valency. This becomes its valency. This becomes its valency. Just a moment. One. 
वन टू थ्री इट बिकम्स इट्स वैलेंसी बट इफ इट इज फाइव सिक्स सेवन देन इट इज गोइंग टू बी एट माइनस द वैलेंस इलेक्ट्रॉन्स See, valency is the combining capacity. That is the number of electrons present in the outermost shell is known as the valence electrons. So, when one, two, three are the valence electrons, when they are the valence electrons, they also become the valency. But when five, six, seven are the valence electrons, then eight minus va valence electrons. Let's say for five, it is going to be eight minus five. The valency is three. Eight minus six. Valency is two. Eight minus seven. Eight minus seven. Valency is one. That's how you calculate the valency. All right. So an outermost shell which had eight electrons was said to possess an octet, and atoms would thus react so as to achieve an octet. That is to achieve the stability. All right. This was done by sharing, gaining, or losing of electrons, which you have already learned when it comes to writing the chemical formula in the previous session. All right, and the number of electrons gained, lost, or shared so as to make the octet of electrons is known as valency, the combining capacity, the combining capacity, which I have explained. Clear? Okay. So this is what this is what looks like the distribution of electrons look like for the first twenty elements. Try doing this by yourself. Just try doing this by yourself. It'll give you much more clarity. It'll give you much more clarity. Now let's talk about the atomic number. What is the atomic number? Atomic number is nothing but the number of protons. In an atom, in an atom, in an atom. Okay. Now, in an electrically neutral atom, in an electrically neutral atom, the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons. In an electrically Neutral atom, the number of protons is equal to number of electrons. That is why it is electrically neutral. For example, for example, let's say number of protons is equal to number of electrons is equal to ten. Let's say so the number proton charge is plus ten, electrons charge is minus ten, so minus ten, which is nothing but plus ten minus ten zero because they cancel each other, right? so atomic number is nothing but the number of protons in an atom in an electrically neutral atom the number of protons is equal to number of electrons so in an electrically neutral atom the atomic number can also be the protons which is also equal to the electrons but we specifically say we specifically say protons for the atomic number because the protons are constant for an atom electrons are not these electrons can be lost they can be gained they can be shared and according to that the atomic number cannot change right so the atomic number we generally use the term protons for this matter now let's see it is the number of protons of an atom which determines its atomic number it is denoted by z all atoms of an element have the same atomic number z that is the atoms of sodium will have the same atomic number the atoms of fluorine will have the same atomic number right in fact elements are defined by the number of protons they possess that's true that's true about this you will learn in your 10th grade okay and therefore the atomic number is defined as the total number of protons present in the nucleus of an atom okay beta all right moving on so what is mass number ma'am ma'am is it same as atomic mass no mass number is different mass number is nothing but mass number is nothing but the sum of the neutrons plus protons the mass of an atom is practically due to the protons and the neutrons alone and we have understood this by rutherford's gold foil experiment have we not right and these are present in the nucleus of an atom hence 
protons and neutrons are also called as nucleons therefore the mass of an atom resides in its nucleus and it is written as n plus p so thereby if x is the symbol of an element a represents the mass number z represents the atomic number a represents the mass number and z represents the atomic number i hope you can see this clear beta is it clear okay moving on mass number for example mass of carbon is 12 u because it has six protons and six neutrons it is written as 12 u similarly the mass of aluminum is 27 u it has 13 protons and 14 neutrons the mass number is defined as the sum of the total number of protons and neutrons present in the nucleus of the atom and is denoted by the letter a denoted by the letter a so now what is isotope a nature see isotope is what happens is not all elements okay now what i tell you in a given element the number of protons are always the same however the neutrons can vary in the same element itself so elements in which whose atomic numbers are same but the number of neutrons in them vary as a result of which their mass number varies is known as an isotope so in an in nature a number of atoms from elements have been identified which have the same atomic number but different mass numbers for example take the case of hydrogen atom and carbon atom hydrogen atom it has just one proton zero neutron it is known as protium deuterium it has one proton and one neutron so one mass number is n plus p which is equal to n plus p which is equal to 1 plus 1 thereby 2 mass number tritium it has one proton okay and two neutrons thereby 3 so the mass number is 3 however in all these cases the protons is not changing the protons remains the same right so entities in which the entities in which the mass no, mass number is different that is same atomic number that is protons but different mass number mass number is nothing but neutrons plus protons proton is same so what is different that is different neutrons different number of neutrons okay same atomic number but different mass number because different number of neutrons is known as isotope one example is that of hydrogen you can see the example of carbon as well carbon exists as carbon 12 13 and 14 the protons is same in all the cases neutrons however vary and you know that it is n plus p so for this it is going to be 12 for this it is going to be 13 and for this it is going to be 14 thereby carbon 12 carbon 13 carbon 14 because difference in the number of neutrons neutrons are different clear beta moving on so is the case for nitrogen also nitrogen exists as nitrogen 14 15 and 16 the number of protons is same in all the cases which is 7 but it is the neutrons that vary it is the neutrons that is varying which is 7 neutrons and 14 okay that means 7 plus 7 is 14 here it is 15 that is 7 plus 8 is 15 that is the neutrons is 15 sorry neutrons is 8 and here the neutrons are 9 so 7 plus 9 that is 16 all right so this is about the isotopes of nitrogen all right so on the basis of these examples we can say that isotopes let me take a different color isotopes are defined as the atoms of the same element same element having the same atomic number but different mass numbers it has the same atomic number but different mass numbers because the proton is same n plus p is different that is n is different where n is nothing but n is nothing but neutrons 
All right. So many elements consist of a mixture of isotopes. You know, each isotope of an element is a pure substance. So the chemical properties of isotopes are similar, but their physical properties differ. Okay, chlorine occurs in nature in two isotopic forms of masses 35U and 37U in the ratio of 3 to 1. Obviously, the question arises, what would we take as the mass of the chlorine atom? Okay, let us find out, let us find out. So, the two isotopes of chlorine are 35 and 37. That is the protons are same. So, abundance, let's see the abundance. So, abundance is for 35 and 37, okay, the 35 and 37, the abundance is 75 percentage. And for 37, the abundance is 12 percentage. So, what we do is 35 into 75 plus 25 into 37, we divide by 100 and thereby we get 35.5 AMU. That's how we calculate the mass of chlorine by, by taking, into, taking into the consideration of both the isotopes and arriving at its mass. Alright kids, moving on to the applications of isotope. See, an isotope of uranium is used as fuel in nuclear reactions. An isotope of cobalt is used in the treatment of cancer. An isotope of iodine is used in the treatment of goiter. It is in the treatment of goiter. So, isotopes are also beneficial to us. Not only are they contributing to the atomic mass of the element, but they are also contributing to us, helping us out. And you can see three examples of this. All right, beta. Now, looking at isobars. Now, what are isobars? Isobars is where iso means same. Same. They have the same mass number. Same mass number. Different elements, okay, different elements having the same mass number. So, calcium's atomic number is 20 and argon's atomic number is 18. However, the mass number of both calcium and argon is 40. So, the total, the total number of nucleons is the same in the atoms of this pair of elements. Nucleons is nothing but, nucleons is nothing but neutron plus proton for both calcium and argon. So, atoms of different elements, this is the definition beta. The atoms of different elements with different atomic numbers which have the same mass number, that is, that is the P is different but the mass number is same, that means, that means N plus P is same, all right, are said to be isobars, they are said to be isobars, all right. So, with this kids, we have come to the end of our session where we have understood about the discovery of the subatomic particles, the model of the atom, all right, along with that, we learned how to fill the energy levels with electrons, we learned about isotopes and isobars and with this kids, I would now like to end the session, see you until next time, keep smiling, keep reading and keep revising, until then, bye bye kids.